So great. Let's let's just get started here. Um, so um, I think it's important to to kind of tell you a little bit about why we why we created the lab. So we developed these labs at BYU. Uh, we started in 1998, um, um, about the time that technology would really let us um, have the colors and the monitors and the and the memory and disk space to kind of do something like this. And we've updated them over time. Um, we used to be sold by Pearson for many years. Um, and um, several years ago, we, we kind of parted ways of Mickle Bleak because we were going in different directions. And uh, so we started Beyond Labs and updated the labs and got them ready so that we could um, distribute. And then in March, COVID hit. And it's been crazy for us ever since. So, um, so, um, but going back in time, the original idea happened when I was a, a grad student at Berkeley, and um, I was a TA for uh, Chem One A, the the um, uh, freshman chemistry class there, and um, and the 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 idea I had, the thing that I noticed as as a TA was I was asking myself why we do the experiments we do. And then I was noticing that students were cookbooking their way and they really weren't doing what I thought was science, right? I was doing research, I was in the lab, I was doing science and yet they were doing different experiments and I was like, well, well, why are we doing these? And the epiphany I had was, um, was that we're constrained when we teach labs to students and an instructional lab, you know, we're constrained, we're constrained by cost, we're constrained by time, we're constrained by how much space we have, we're constrained by safety issues, we're constrained by liability issues. So there's a whole boatload of things that we can't do with the, with the real lab. Um, and so, but for decades, many decades, we've been teaching labs and thinking, well, this is how it's done. And so my idea was to create a set of virtual labs, not to replace the real lab, but to augment it, to add to it, to increase our tool chest as instructors on how we can teach students what science really is. So the whole idea behind the virtual labs were to prepare students for real labs, to um, be able to test their understanding after doing a real lab, to, re to um, allow them to do experiments they wouldn't have access to because it wouldn't be safe or cost effective um, and um, and also to just really i mean the fundamental principle is to get students to 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 think to make mistakes and to learn from those mistakes so that's kind of the idea behind what we're trying to do and so what i want to kind of show you is um, i want to be able to kind of show you what our labs look like and how we've designed but as you, as i go through and i demo i can't demo all the things that we've done because we don't have time but um, um i do kind of, kind of want you to kind of think of them in terms of pre-lab post-lab um doing experiments so for example i know there's a lot of schools who do like molecular model building and and a chemistry lab but i was like well maybe there's some other experiments that that we can do that would be um, more useful or, or new or uh, um, teach principles. So that's kind of the idea of, of, of what I want to do here. So what we have is we have what's called um, at Beyond Labs, we have a portal. So um, and so uh, we sell so students get licenses. So we either sell blocks of licenses to uh, schools or students purchase their licenses directly from our website. But in the end, there's a license. And so what they do is they will, we have a link on our website and it goes to portal. It's, it's called portal.beyondlabs.com. And um, what they'll do is they'll register and create a email address with a password and they'll log in and they'll get to this website here. And then when they first log in, we, we step them through a sign up process where they put in their license code. And um, so here's a license code that I have for, for mine. And so they'll be um, activated so that they can use the website. 
licenses last for a year um, and they give them access to all of the labs. So these are all of the different lab products we have. So we have chemistry, organic chemistry, the biology, physics, and a physical science product that's geared more towards middle school, high school down there. And we also have a library of lab activities. So just because you may be teaching freshman chemistry doesn't mean that you might want to go into physics and use density or something like that. And so you can click chemistry. We have lower level ones. We call them high school, but they're meant for like that intro, like um, who was that, Alex, I think you taught, uh, intro level class that might be appropriate for that. And we have your typical higher ed gen chem class and they're organized and this is our content. So this is really important. I'll sh I'm gonna come back to this, but it's really important to see how we've designed the labs is what we've done is we've tried to replicate the real labs. And so just like we do in real labs where you open the door, the students go in and they have the lab, but they don't know what to do. Our labs are kind of the same way. They're full of all of the science you can do but we don't explicitly tie the pedagogy, the activities in the software to the lab itself. What we do is we separate the two so that, um, so that it gives you flexibility and it gives us flexibility and also allows the students not to be so artificially guided. So we have activities. We have about 350 total. We have about 80 for higher ed chemistry, about 30 for um, high school chemistry, about 35 for biology, and 100 and so, 100 and so for organic chemistry. And so that's kind of how it works. So I'm going to go in. So what a student would see here is they would see a button here that says install. They'd click that. That would download the product onto their machine and, and, and install it. And then they would click open. And, um, and so when it when you click open, what it does is it comes down here and it's going to start the it's going to start the actual lab product. So each of our products are collections of lab benches. So we here's general chemistry. So we have titrations, calorimetry, inorganic gases, and quantum. Physics has quantum gases and calorimetry because those experiments are taught and performed in physics, but we also have other lab benches. So the, the product is designed around these lab benches. So, so, um, so what we have are lab benches and we have activities. The activities here provide the guidance, the background information. So here's thermodynamics. So if I were to do an experiment and I want them to do Hess's law, for example, they would click on Hess's law and here's this PDF worksheet. Um, gives them a little bit of background, but you notice that we don't have a lot of pre-lab questions. We're, we're, trying to, to, we're trying to provide you this base part, the procedures of how to do the experiments, but you can take our content and add your own pre-lab questions. We step through the procedures we collect the data, we step them through other questions. All of the labs are different. They have different types of questions and assessments. And, um, and so that's kind of how it works. So what a student would do is they would come back over here and they would go, oh, let's do thermodynamics. And my teacher assigned me to do Hess's law. I click on Hess's law. And what that does is that brings me to this, to the calorimetry lab and notice that my experiment is already predefined. So our labs have this ability to be completely open-ended, but we also have the ability to preset and predefine configuration. So here's one with sodium hydroxide. You zoom in on the balance, they can see what the mass is. Um, come back here, we've already, the instructions already tell them how much water has been added. So what they do is they would come over here and first thing they would do is they would click um, save to save this data. And then they would drag this over, drop in the sodium hydroxide. And then they'll see monitor what's going on here with the graph. And we're saving the data. They don't want to wait. They can accelerate time in the lab, wait for it to come to equilibrium. So 
Um, so we just performed a heat of solution for sodium hydroxide and, um, and then the instructions. So they come back here and these, uh, the content here set, tells them everything that they're supposed to do, drag the weight paper, you know, um, in the, and then save this data. And then they'll okay, okay, do a reaction too. click on the red disposal bucket, clear the lab click on the clipboard and select heat of reaction, HCl and NaOH. So they would click stop. Here they've saved in this lab book here, they've saved this data, which they can copy to analyze. See, here's the, all the data and um, shows what this is. They can also save this graph, click over here to reset will come to the stock room. So notice in the stock room, completely open-ended, they can pick organic salts, reactions. But what we're going to do is we're gonna have them pick heat of reaction for um, aqueous HCl and NaOH. So here's our HCl, we've already measured it out. It's 200 milliliters. They're gonna go add that. Um, it's equilibrated to the room, so there's no temperature effects here. And then we come in here, we weighed out approximately four grams, and then we'll just add, before I do that, I made a mistake again, and I'm gonna click save, so I can save my data, then we're just gonna go do it. So this is kind of how a student journey would be. Here's content, um, we can preset the lab, we, we're, we've kind of designed this, activity here not to be how to set up the experiment so much but how to collect the data and analyze the data so that's the beauty of what we have here is these labs are like real labs they're completely flexible and you get to set up the the, the pedagogy to see where you're going to focus are you going to focus on on how to build the experiment how to set it up correctly are you going to focus on on how to collect the data and analyze the data to get the answers, or are you going to try to do the whole package? So we, in our content, in our lab activities, we have a wide selection of, um, a wide selection of that kind of um, content that you can use. So. Brian, can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Um, a couple people have asked and they want to see what these LTI worksheets look like. Do you mind if I just show that quickly now that while you've been talking? Sure, sure. That would be good. So yeah, so I guess Heather has been saying that. So we have PDFs, but we also, Heather, put a lot of work into uh, converting all of this into a digital format that can be integrated through an LTI integration into your LMS. So go ahead. Okay, so this is just, this is what he exactly was just showing these exact same Gen Chem worksheets. So for example, if I just open, um, say, acid-based chemistry, this is what it would look like to your students. Instead of having to figure out um, how to deal with a PDF, they can do these and it just submits, right? So they just fill out all the answers right here in Canvas or Blackboard or whatever elements you have, submit them to you. You can do all your grading from within. Um, your LMS, they can submit all their files and they can use this LTI integration to be able to just make it a little bit easier and it's way easier on your end for the grading. So Alex, you were asking what this looks like. I don't know if you wanna unmute and ask any questions on it, but so these aren't editable. So if you're wanting to edit our content, this is not your, not your product, um, but for those of you that want to use our content, this could be a great add-on. Um, that, so that, yeah, that's all I, I wanted to show there, just that they, <laughs> they exist and we have, we have the worksheets here for you if you want to integrate them in. So what, um, what some customers do, so we got about 60, at least 60% of our customers modify our content, which is actually what we want because we know everyone has their own way of doing it. Um, I know that I don't like being told how to teach my class um and so but if you do want to edit the content but you still want um a more electronic you know we don't we're not to that point where we can uh, provide that that ability to edit our digital content yet but what some customers do is they take our pdf files and they just create their own assignments on their lms system and then add their own questions or subtract their questions 
But the core to what our content provides the students is that is the procedures, how to get, how to do the experiment. That's the hard part that nobody wants to try to figure out and write all those. That's what we have. Um, and, um, and so, so the, the other thing about the content now that, that since we're spending some time on it, that's interesting is it, it full, it fulfills multiple purposes. How do you onboard the students so they know what to do? Well, our research, we've, we published a couple of papers um, a decade or so ago. Um, and, um, um, you know, onboarding, teaching students how to use the software, the best way to do it is to give them an assignment and just do a worksheet. It's just once they kind of go through, the kids really pick up the interface because how all the different lab benches work is pretty similar. So once they learn one, they learn all the other ones. So giving them an assignment, like an easy one, um, is, is full, uh, fulfills the dual purpose of teaching them how to use the software, but at the same time, um, teaching them the science and doing an experiment. And some of our assignments, like that Hess's Law, could be longer. That could be like a 45-minute assignment or even to an hour for some students. Some of our contents, like 10 or 15 minutes. So. It's also nice to uh, combine some of these together, like in a titration experiment, maybe you wanna teach them what a titration curve looks like, and then you tell them how to predict the equivalence point, and then you have them build up the experiment, and then at the end you have them do an unknown. So maybe you put a whole bunch of them together to make one larger assignment. So, questions? All right, so, so I kind of showed you what a student journey would look like. You give them an assignment, they click on the preset, they go to the lab, they follow the procedures, they answer the questions, and it goes through. But there's also the sandbox mode. So, I'm, so we have, again, lots of this content. Um, you can develop and write your own. By no means does our content even cover a fraction of what the labs will do. Um, and so, uh, right now, what I'm going to do now is kind of even for the organic chemists and the bi and the and uh, the biologists on the call, the, the the labs work the same way. So, what I'm going to kind of spend the rest of the time is showing what these different lab benches will do. So we're at 12. Well, for me, 12:25. So um, let me spend some time going through some general and some organic chemistry, and then reserve the rest of the time for biology. So I've shown you calorimetry, that's a quantitative lab. Here is our inorganic lab, and it's a qualitative, okay? So the idea here is learn about reactions, inorganic reactions. So in this lab, notice it's, again, it's open-ended. I took a test tube from my rack, put it on the stand. I show a real picture of what's in it, which is nothing. I can go add copper, cations, cobalt, chromium. I can take any of these 26, any order, any combination and add them, and I'm gonna show a real picture of what's in it, and we're gonna show the chemical state. So I could take this, put it on the rack. I come over here, notice the white labels, I could label these. Notice that we also have reactions, like what if I add silver, but then I add ferrous, then we get a reaction where the silver's reduced and the iron's oxidized to, to plus three. So you know, so we, it's not just mixing cations and looking at them. And then we have these different lab op, um, manipulations we can do. We can do a flame test. So here's a flame test. See the green for the copper. All Again, all real video, real results. Flame test with a cobalt filter. I can decant, divide, heat, pH of the solution, pH of the vapor. Um, smell it, and so on. And then you have these 11 reagents. So we have strong acid, strong base, buffers, uh, peroxide for oxidation reduction, and we have complexes and, and uh, anions for different precipitates. So you can do a complete separation and, and identification scheme for up to 26 cations, but of course you don't have to do them all. You can make them simple or whatever. And so, I can go here to pH 10, 
and I see the results. So I see they're all precipitates, go back to pH seven, go to sodium hydroxide, chromium xanthatyric. Now on the centrifuge, I can centrifuge it. I can come here and decant. Now I've separated my chromium. I could go add peroxide, um, and I didn't want to do that. Um, so maybe we can um, reduce it back now with my heat. So I've got them reduced. I want to go add my chromium here, and that's what I wanted to add my peroxide to. So notice I go to chromate. So we've got all of these outcomes, but notice I, I can make mistakes just like I did. And so I just reduced it by um, adding some base here. And so now I can go, let's go to pH 10 and I'm gonna go add ammonia. I get a complex, go to sodium hydroxide for the cobalt precipitate centrifuge, the cant. Now I've done a separation, go to pH 10, go to add carbonate from cobalt carbonate. And so, you can do all of this chemistry. This is all real chemistry. It's not based on solubility tables. Um, this is based on actual experiments. We had four students working for two years full time, uh, going through and um, and uh, doing all of these permutations, taking the pictures, and creating the database that shows these these results. We can also create unknowns. So notice here we have a clipboard. I showed you a clipboard in calorimetry. Clipboards have preset experiments. So here's a preset experiment for say chlorides. And this one is an unknown. So they can come over here and say, okay, what do I have? I'm gonna go add acid. I'm gonna go add chloride. I'm gonna go add heat. Centrifuge that while it's hot, decant. And I don't have lead, take off the heat, go add ammonia. Um, and make sure I'm uh, low enough pH for that. So I'll go pH 10. Looks like I just have silver. I can reacidify it. So then what I can do is go to my lab book and click report and say, I only have silver, submit that. And um, that's the, um, so I get them all right. So we have the ability to do unknown. So, this is not just a qual lab and for doing unknowns. We use it for teaching stoichiometry in terms of stoichiometries of reactions, for teaching different kinds of reactions and complexes, colors. So it's actually pretty good. Um, so I'm going to speed it up here a little bit. But I just want to emphasize that open-endedness. So here's our titration lab. We have a burette, beakers, pipettes, different sizes. Take a beaker. Uh, you can come over here to the stock room, get KHP, for example, and sodium hydroxide. So you can titrate any acid with any base or oxidation reduction titrations. I can fill up my burette and open it up. I can turn on my pH meter, conductivity meter. Notice my pH meter isn't calibrated. I can put it in the pH 4 buffer come over here and put it into the pH 10. And now I have a calibrated, um, I can go do a titration with KHP. Here's my balance, weight paper. Every weight paper weighs different. It's randomized, so it's more realistic for the students. So if I put this on, you'll see that it weighs different. Um, zoom back out, I forgot my bottle. Put my bottle over here, take off the lid and um, go add some. So I don't know how much to add, 0.2 grams. Add that to my beaker. And I could add water by taking it to the distilled water tap. Or I could add it with these different graduated cylinders. Or I could go take a beaker and fill it with the tap if I wanted to. And um, take an indicator here turn on my stirring and um, I'm going to go take my probe, put it over here. Now I have the pH, click save my data. I'm going to click graph to open a graph down here and um, have a conductivity meter in here. Um, and so now I can go do the titration. So we have these different rates. You can do dropwise and 
saving the data to the lab book so you can do titrations here. The important thing to recognize here, so I'm gonna to get to my endpoint pretty quick. There we go, color changes. You can do colorimetric, you can use the pH. The balance here, same thing in calorimetry with the balance, it gives observed masses and the glassware is not perfect. It has to be, if you want the ultimate accuracy, you have to calibrate this using water. So each student gets a, their own volumetric errors built into the glassware. So they're systematically wrong and, um, and, and, and so on. So um, it's what you can do there. Um, we have gas experiments here. So the idea is to explore gas laws. So we have these different chambers. I'm just gonna show you one of them here with the balloon. These are real gases and you can have an ideal gas. You can do ideal gas mixtures to show Dalton's law. Real gases, so here's carbon dioxide. Open up the regulator and add some gas. Zoom in. You can change units. Stay in kilopascals, go to atmospheres, increase the pressure, or you can go down here and decrease the pressure. So you can collect this data, save it, and uh, get it too big and it pops. And so kind of the last one here is, um, is um, the quantum mechanics. So remember I told you that pre-lab, post-lab, lab exams, um, you know, um, you know you, this is really great for lectures, for getting more engagement for students when you're doing lecture. But this lab here, that we call it the quantum lab, and it's the example of experiments students would never do. So what we have here is a, a, anybody, the user, can pick, say, hey, let's go get a gas. So I'm going to come here through a gas, and um, let's go, oh, those are liquids. So here's my gases, and let's go add carbon dioxide to it. I'm going to need voltage so I can excite this and let's go let's go get a video camera for example so I'll go in here with a video camera and we'll put this out here and we'll put our um, electric field on it and so this is an alternating field and then what I can do is take my video camera and turn on my video camera so I can just take a picture of it. So I can take a picture of it over here from this side. And then what I can do is I can turn on my voltage and see, so I finally got the voltage high enough, it's alternating current, so I get that to glow. And so notice that we don't restrict, we're not just saying you only get one position, they have to go look at, they can use the video camera to look at it from different positions if they just wanna see it and they can put this video camera back but then they can go grab the spectrometer and go put that spectrometer out and turn on the spectrometer and then they can go see the spectra from this for the full spectrum just in the visible spectrum and they can come over here and zoom and zoom in and see the different lines so they can take spectra of different gases so look at what we can do here. We have lasers, electrons, super light bulbs, alpha particles, and we have different kinds of detectors with different kinds of samples, liquids, gases, metal foils, oil mist. So there's a whole collection of experiments. And that's really why we have this clipboard here is to do these different experiments. So here's Rutherford. So instead of expecting students to say, hey, go build the Rutherford experiment, we build it for them. But now we want them to focus on what does it mean? Well, what happens if I remove my gold? Here's my spot of alpha particles. What happens if I close my shutter? Open it, put it in front. I get a big spot here. I get these alpha particles deflecting. What if I move my detector over here? What if I move it to the side? I can go into persist mode and save where these alpha particles hit. So, you know, I have 500,000 in alpha particles per second coming out of this americium source. And again, this is not, you know, fictionalized. This is actually real backscattering data. Um, 
that we have. And so they can do Rutherford. They can come here and do Thompson's experiment and actually um, turn on a grid and they can actually bend, bend the, that beam of electrons and apply a magnetic field and calculate charge to mass ratio. They can come over here and do Millikan oil drop experiment, change voltages, measure the charge of the electron. They can do photoelectric effect with the bolometer. And so here's the signal way down here. And so what happens if they change the wavelength? What happens if they change the intensity so they can actually calculate work functions and do photoelectric effect? Two slit diffraction, change the, change the intensity um, and change the wavelength and see different colors go into persist mode. All of this kind of data can get saved to the lab book and such like that. So it's really great experiment that, that we can do. So any questions about general chemistry? I just for the interest of time to the biologists have been patient. Um, let me go organic for like, um, for like 10 minutes and then spend the other 10 minutes on, on biology. Any questions on general before we go? We've been trying to address them as we go in chat, but feel free to mute and chime in anyone. Okay. All right, so um, organic chemistry. We have two lab benches in this product. We have a synthesis lab bench and a qualitative analysis lab bench. Again, same idea. We have presets down here that match up to our content. Let me just kind of show you what the lab does. Um, so, um, so in the synthesis lab, it's geared around uh, synthetic targets. What kind of um, product are you trying to make? What are the right starting materials? So the idea is this list on the chalkboard, you can see the structures list different starting materials that are available. So different sets of starting materials. So the idea is kind of like, you know, in our, in our organic lab at uh, BYU, um, you know, for the day, for the week, um, TA's stockroom attendants put out the chemicals they're going to need for a certain experiment, but nothing keeps the students, if they wanted to, or if they wanted to be sneaky, to do other reactions. And so that's the idea here is, these are named reactions. So if I click a sterification, um, these are available starting materials. And what a student can do is they can pick none, zero, one, or two, any order, any combination of these. So if I take the phenyl acetic acid, add it, you can see it's a solid in my round bottom. I'm gonna add this, this alcohol. And they can do two acids. So even though it's a sterification and they want an acid and an alcohol, um, they don't have to, right? They can make that mistake and we're gonna have an outcome. They can add uh, zero or one solvent here. So they can add a solvent. Um, I'm not going to. Um, I'm going to now take it out. Stockroom closes. And now I'm going to be out here um, um, in this uh, lab. Now I'm on my stir plate. So I could just start the reaction if I wanted to. But I have these 15 reagents that I can add, any order, any combination. Um, so that's why I, I keep on saying that they can do any reaction here because they can do any reaction associated with any of these uh, reagents. So even no reactions or whatever. So I'm going to go add sulfuric acid and now I can go build. So I could, I just double clicked. I added the condenser. I could add heat. I could make a mistake and not add nitrogen, start the reaction and this would blow up. And after, after about 30 minutes, um, but I'm gonna go add nitrogen to it. So now I've added starting materials, I've, I've built it, now I'm gonna press start. So now my reaction's going and I can monitor my, monitor my reaction with TLC. So um, here's the product I'm already making, here's my starting materials. I could save that to the lab book. So I'm going to advance 10 minutes um, and uh, monitor my TLC. So 
So we actually have the correct kinetics built in here. So we allow all the permutations for starting materials, solvents, reaction setups. So these are actually second order kinetics. Um, and so I did it with heat, so it's gonna be faster. I could do it at room temperature. I could do it with ice and we would have the correct kinetics. So um, notice here that if I do a TLC, spots are getting smaller, but they're gonna, uh, uh, reaction's gonna slow down as I go. So I'm gonna go 10 more minutes and put this here. So my spots are really small. So these spots represent how much product are there. And then I'll just go 10 more minutes and I'm done. Com um, um, verify I'm done with this. And so now I'm done. So now what I can do is I can work it up. So now at any point, so I'm not forced to wait until I'm done. We could work, the student could work it up at any point, have a mixture. And then once they work up, they have access to these aqueous reagents. So for this case, I, on, I only need water, but let's pretend I made it an acid. So, or I made two products and one was an acid and I wanted to, to separate it. So I could go add sodium hydroxide, for example, and move it to the aqueous layer and then remove the organic layer here and then go back and go add reprotonate it to pull it back into the organic layer. Now, obviously I didn't have an acid, but you can do countercurrent extractions um, here. And so now I've separated, I could, if I wanted to, I could, um, let's see if I can, uh, move the whole funnel back. And I could, if I wanted to move this here and then do a distillation, um, and separate if I had to, a mixture of products here, but now obviously if you're doing organic one, you know, you're not going to do spectroscopy right away, so you could stop here. And, um, but we can do um, spectroscopy on our samples. So here's a proton NMR. So these are actual 300 megahertz um, proton um, NMR spectra. So these are actual spectra, so they're not perfect. Zoom in, look at the peak splitting. These peak numbers represent the areas underneath the curve. Uh, we can also switch to a carbon-13 probe and um, come in here and do carbon-13 spectra. And you can do FTIR. All of these spectras can get saved to your lab book. And then you can do mass spec. And, um, <clears throat> and that's what you get here on your mass spec. So you get your peak up here. See masses. So all of that to analyze confirmed products and things like that. So I haven't shown you mistakes. You know, you can, students can make mistakes. They can blow it up. They can make tar. They can have exothermic reaction with the wrong. So we have all the different outcomes associated with that. So it's approximately a few million different permutations that are accounted for in this. It is single step. Um, um, so you can't take the products and start over again, but we're working on that maybe for another release uh, later this year. So this is, that was synthesis and um, in qualitative analysis, um, what we realize is that we have about 800 spectra, um, you know, NMR, 800 NMR, 800 um, FTIR spectra. And so we realized that we had the ability to teach students how to do qualitative analysis, how to determine their structures. So what we did here is you have different functional groups and the structures you're seeing are known compounds. So if I pick aldehydes, each one of these are known so a student can practice and then they have an unknown. So I can take that unknown and it to my round bottom, take the round bottom, put it on the on the cork ring here, and it's a numbered unknown over here. So we have a key. By the way, we have answers. We have an answer key. We have an uh, instructor guide for all of our worksheets and for the unknowns. So here's a boiling point CH analysis. And then they can, again, do, do spectra. So here's NMR, you know, they could do a TLC to go see what's the polarity. You know, where is that? 
on the on the RF scale. And then what they can also do here is um, do um, functional group tests. So they can do a Jones oxidation. So can you oxidize it? This is a positive test. So we show real pictures or real video of these positive tests. Um, so I'm gonna pause this and dispose of it and get rid of it. And then we're going to come over here and you know do a permanganate test. And so so that's what so students can come over here and do that. So what they would do is manually report, hey, I got unknown number 210. This is what I think I have. We also have the ability to come over here and do random unknowns, aldehydes. And so this one doesn't have an unknown number. So they don't know what it is. They'd come over here, show a picture of it, you know, do a bromine test and see if this positive or negative. Then when they're all done, they click on the lab book, they click report, they write their name. I don't know. I'm not a organic chemist, click submit, and then it shows them what their what the answer is. So that's organic in, in a nutshell. It's it's really powerful. Um, Pre-lab, post-lab, you know, if you're, you know, we're obviously can't get in, most schools can't get into the real lab. And so it's great as a lab replacement, but um, we've got research data that we published in JKMED that it shows if students do so what with the research we did is we did pre-labs and we did post-labs, having them do one experiment in the lab, and then they had to do a similar one without procedures. And uh, the data that we saw for uh, thousands of students at BYU was the, um, there was a 30% increase in performance on the lab exams by, by using this. So it's a pretty powerful tool. Okay, questions about organic. So right on time, thank you for being patient for biology as I get this up, but while it's starting up, any, any questions? All right, biology. So biology requires a little bit of explanation and what we were trying to do. So, a, I'm not a biologist, so my co-authors on this were um, uh, Keith Crandall. He's a evolutionary biologist at George Washington University in D.C. And uh, Riley Nelson, he's an entomologist and um, outstanding general biology teacher here at BYU. And um, so they decided what we were going to, um, you know, what labs we were going to put together. So the idea was, was um, again, you know, biology requires going out in the field and collecting species and, and analyzing them. And our thinking was, is what can we provide virtually that would not be normally accessible to a general biology student. Yes, you could have them go collect some bugs, but like right now in Provo, it's snowing and that's not going to work very well. But, but um, what kind of experiments did, do we want to provide them that we talk about in general biology, but normally students wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do it for time or cost um, or just brick and mortar constraints. So the idea of this lab is it's species centric. It's centered around studying species from various standpoints. So what do the species look like? So here's microscopy. What is their genetic makeup using genetics? What is their DNA makeup from molecular biology? How do species interact with each other and the environment? And then how do we organize species? So there are um, many experiments we're not um, simulating yet. It's on our to-do list, but these, given our budget and the time that we had when we developed this, just took three years um, to develop all of these labs. And so, um, and so this, this is what we have. So 
Um, I'm just going to go through and spend the time I have to kind of show you what each of the five lab benches do. So again, it's species centric. So we have what's called a species selector and there's different ways of organizing. So look at the plants, look at the animals, look at bacteria. You can look at them in terms of, of characters, extinct, you know, lacking a nucleus, um, classify them in terms of the birds, um, classify them in terms of where they live in terms of tundra and, and or look at different genetic models. And so it's all about studying the species. So we have about 175 species in our database. Um, I'm coming down here trying to find a cool one, paramecium. So we have about 3,500 images in our library. So here's paramecium, I pick paramecium, and what we show is we show what's the right microscope and what do the different microscopes show us. So here's paramecium. So we're not teaching students how to mount. Mounting um, for different microscopes is a big deal. Um, we don't, that's really difficult for us to, uh, to teach virtually. So we decided to focus instead on what do the micro microscopes teach us. So here's a visible light microscope. Um, we, give them, we give them magnification. Um, they can put labels on it. I can click here to other ones, different magnifications. We have different species. So we took like 95% of these images ourselves with staining. And then what they can do is switch over here to an SEM and say, wow, this is a lot different on an SEM. Um, um, that, how is an SEM different? What does it allow me to do? Well, it's going to be dead when I'm looking at them on an SEM because they're coated in gold. But, um, but this is what, um, different microscopes do. So the microscopy lab has a large database of images to, um, to study. We have TEM images. We actually have simulations of different processes. So for example, if I go to human, um, obviously these, you know, we're not the first one to do these simulations, but here's one, for example, of, um, um, transcription animation so we said hey if we had a virtual really cool tem what could we show so these are all real real structures um and so we're going to show transcription here so genetics so in the genetics lab um, um what we have is, again, species. We got a much smaller collection of our species here, but these are key important genetic models. So we can pick fruit fly, for example. And down here, um, we have a series of traits associated with that species. So human, we have a whole bunch of different traits and fruit flies. So students can go explore these traits and they can pick multiple traits so we can come down here and pick um, head shape, for example, and they can pick multiple um, traits at the same time and explore. And what we've done is we've included the actual genetic models of each of these traits. So many are Mendelian, but many are not. Codominance, incomplete dominance, epistasis, um, gene linkages are built into this. Um, and so what the students know, so we have sex linked genes. So we can go over here and manually create the genotype of the parents, or, or I could do it randomly or do it manually. And then what, so we have a natural number of offspring that each of the species will make. So there's about a hundred on average for fruit fly. So I do a cross. And then what we show is we show the, we show the statistics and these are stochastically driven on the genetic model so they're going to be different for students um, and they get to go and they can unclick separating by male and female because it doesn't look like there's any linkages to to um, uh, male or female and then what they can also do is look at the individual offspring so here's a female with a with a leg sticking out of its head and then they can see the genotype see the genotype of the parents that produced it Here's the male with one, 
female, male, so they can actually go do it. And then what they can do is pick, they can actually do a next generation, pick the two that, that will be mated, and then see how you can propagate different um, traits and phenotypes over time. We also have the ability to do population genetics. So in a population genetics, so we can see drift, simple random drift. We have fitness parameters. We have mutation rates. So go over here and calculate and see over generations how long it would take to change the gene frequency, different mating parameters, linkage disequilibrium. All of that data can be saved. So interest of time here, this is our molecular lab. So what we've done is for each of our species, of our 175 species, we went to GenBank and extracted um, a set of genes that were common amongst most, if not all, of the species. So if you come over here to um, help here, for example, nobody ever looks at this, but if you come over here and you look at the simulation, what we do when you scroll down is we give a list of all the genes that we extracted, and then we show which genes have been included for each species. So it's kind of get to know what's possible. So these are many genomes, but these are real gene sequences. So what they can do, take epinorph tubes, you could label, edit, label it epinorph tube, you can, um, so here's like um, housefly, you can take that, and then you can take a pipette, go add some DNA, go add your nucleotides, go add your TAC, and then you can come over here and pick your primers, add your primers, then you can run it through your jet, through your PCR, then you can come over here and set up your um, gel electrophoresis, put on your put on your electrodes, and then when you're done, you can come over here and uh, sequence it. So you can go through here, check all these things, and um, um, analyze their sequences, convert them to proteins, and compare and contrast amongst all the different species and their genes. In the ecology lab, um, what we have here is, again, we have our species. And what you can do is pick different, um, different biomes, different um, um, biome southern hemisphere northern hemisphere and and then what you can do is change your elevation for example or change your latitude and then we're going to based on based on um, average weather average weather patterns across the globe that we put into this then you get where you're at latitude elevation you get different amounts of water and and different temperatures, so here's desert. And so, so you get to control these abiotic variables and there's so much to do for students just to look at um, biomes and, and the effect of elevation and things on, on these abiotic variables. And then what you can do is start putting species into these different biomes. And then you can control multiple species and have those species eat each other or give them food. You can you can have population influx or outflux or catastrophes and you're tracking this so just a, uh, an example here would be wolf and elk in a temperate deciduous forest you click play and what we do here is we track the population we track the population of here the first one is going to be the elk and this one here is the wolf and you track that over time you can see that they're being eaten, there's spring where there's births, and you can see that in general, elk are going down, wolf are going up. And um, so you can slow this down, look at what the precipitation is that day, you know, for the, and here we just gave the elk excess food so we didn't have to have any plants for them to eat. So you can see that the elk population crashed and now the wolf are gonna crash because they don't have enough to eat. And so they're gonna crash down and. So you can study that. And finally, systematic. So the whole idea is, is what species are related to what species? How do we know, how do we prove evolution? How do we demonstrate that 
a species is related to another species and that it was earlier late in its evolutionary history. So the idea again is to pick is to pick a species and then the idea is we can pick different um, taxonomy. So here is a, a classic three domain taxonomy that's in Campbell, for example, or this is a six kingdom um, one that's in the high school text um, by Miller Levine. Here's a Linnaean. Here is a made up simple one to show how it works. And here's the, the real research grade tree of life. And then what happens is the students have to go over here, mouse over, they look at the traits. So does this have a cytoplasm? And hey, what the heck is a cytoplasm? They click on it. We have a glossary of terms. And so they say, yeah, this is gonna be Eukara, and then it's gonna be Unicanta. And down here, you're showing species that are related and not related um, as you go through and do this. You can make this go horizontal, make it look like a tree. You can zoom out. And, and so that's not the right one. So I can do metazoa. Um, and then that's not the right one. And so bilateralia. And so you just build them out and, and students can go through this activity to compare the data from all the different labs and show how they're related to each other. So that's kind of how it works. We got, again, we've got, yeah, the molecular biology lab looks really complex. We get a lot of that. Hey, it's complex. I don't see how students can do it. But again, we've got really great activities that, um, um, that we've developed that um, DNA, for example, where we have them go do some some DNA sequencing for tigers and some forensic science. Um, we also have some um, really nice longer projects, sickle cell anemia, introduction to microscopy, teaching them about microscopy and crime scene forensics and things like that. So lots of cool activities, but again, you can develop your own, modify what we have. So that was the tour, questions, comments?